Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole Webb, and we really hope the message today blesses you. If you'd like to know more about Liberty Church, please go online to lbcdublin.com. Can you believe she would actually give Florida Gators props on our stage? Like, that's just unbelievable. A little bit sinful if you ask me, but, but that's okay. Hey, so how many of you all cheered for your team yesterday and got excited or frustrated one of the two? It was a stressful day to me. I said some of y'all aren't being honest. It was a stressful day to me. Y'all know I'm a Louisville fan. The hurricane, they were playing Hurricanes, and Miami almost beat us. We came out with a victory. We were going to the ACC championship. But if you cheered for your team, let's everybody do this. Everybody stand up real quick. Everybody stand up. So we were like, come on. I don't want to stand up. Just for a second. If we can cheer for our team from the couch or from the stand, then let's cheer for Jesus right now. Come on. Let's hear it. Yeah. Let's go. All right. Touchdown, Jesus. No, we're not Notre Dame fans. We don't do that. That's awesome. If you got your Bible, John 6 is where we'll be reading. Tailgate Sunday has been fun. There'll be hot dogs and chips and stuff. If you didn't get that on the way in, but they'll, they'll be there on the way out. So John 6, we're talking about when Jesus feeds the 5,000. So I've actually been to this mountain slash hill. It says in Scripture, it's a mountain. It's, I guess you could call it a mountain. It's on, the, and it's on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. We're on the Sea of Galilee in Israel. We just left Capernaum, which is miles away. And we're sitting there and they said, hey, they, they believe, the experts believe that that's actually the hill that Jesus fed the 5,000. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. We're on the Sea of Galilee. It's a moment, like I'm tearing up. I got my sunglasses on because I don't cry in public. That's just immature. And, um, and so I'm, I'm looking at the hill and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can, I can imagine. They're in, 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 uh, in stacks of 20 people, not stacks, that's weird. In, a, in groups of 150 people and they're all scattered about. And they said, hey, what do you notice about that hill? I was like, well, it's very steep. I mean, it's like a mountain. He said, imagine being the disciples feeding everybody. You're running up and down that hill. I was like, well, that would definitely get your quads for sure. And he's like, yeah, it was a workout for what they had to do. And they had to eat last. And I was like, wow, what a great picture of one of the things that happened on that hill outside of the Sea of Galilee. And so it's pretty incredible. But one of the neat things about this is it's the only miracle recorded in all four gospels. So if this is one of your first times in church and you don't know a lot about the Bible, there's the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, and then there's the New Testament, which is kind of the story of Jesus and the story of the disciples. And so the first four books in the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's four different men that wrote the similar, different accounts of the same story. And so they're telling different perspective, different angles. I saw this person, I saw this person, just different perspectives of the entire situation. And so it's pretty neat that it's the only miracle recorded in all four gospels. And so today, we're going to be looking through three characters in Scripture. We're going to be looking at all three characters, Philip, Andrew, and the boy. And so it, it's also referenced, so we're going to be looking at John 6. It's also in Matthew 14, Mark 6, and Luke 9. If you read all four, you'd see little differences, but ultimately you see the same story. So John 6, 1 through 14 says this. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up to a mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Verse 5. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them even to have a little. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and, a, and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass and in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fifth fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told the disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Verse 14, when, they, when the people saw the sign, the sign had been done, he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who has come into the world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And Lord, I pray that your word comes alive in this place today. I pray that we'll put everything aside and we'll hear from you and only you. 
Lord, let your word speak to us and apply it to our heart and to our life situation so that we can leave closer to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. So I, can, I can't help but think about the people in this passage. Like, so we can't really relate what it would look like to travel miles away from any civilization, from any Walmart, from any gas station, from any Dollar General. Like it's hard to really understand what that would be like, but they walked miles following this guy. And here's the crazy thing. They didn't know who he really was. They just saw him do some cool miracles and they're like, we're gonna follow this guy. And so imagine, so research says, it says in scripture, it says 5,000 men. For some reason, they counted only men in the New Testament times. And so if you do the math, that's anywhere from 15 to 25,000 people. Cause you got wives, you got 2.2 kids. And so you're looking at about 15 to 25,000 people. So you say 20,000 people walking together in a group following one man. They're all going after him. Here's the thing. They don't know what they're gonna eat. They have their kids. They don't know what they're, where they're going to sleep, but they're just following Jesus. Like it's, it's pretty incredible to watch because they're basically saying like, I don't know what we're gonna do. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but I'm not going to miss a moment in front of this Messiah. Like, I love that because if the American church looked like that today, like, look, I don't, I don't know where I'm gonna eat. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I don't know where I'm gonna sleep but I just don't want to miss a minute with Jesus. I feel like the American church would look a lot different if we're gonna be honest. And don't you wish we kind of had a little bit of that mentality? And I can definitely say we, not you. I can say we for sure. Um, because here's the thing. We know what Jesus is about. Like most of us in this room, some of y'all are probably new. This might be the first time you walked into church and you're so glad you're here. No judgment how long it's been since you've been here. We're honored that you came to church this morning. But a lot of us in this room have been in church every week since we were a kid. I can think back, back to the time since I was about 20 years old. I probably missed church, and that's only about, about seven years ago or so. Just kidding, I'm a little bit older than that. But I probably missed church maybe about four to five times. Even when I'm on vacation, I don't miss church. I know what Jesus is about. I've seen the miracles that he's done in my life and my family's life, some of your lives. And you're like, yeah, most of them can be explained by circumstance. No, not really. I've seen some pretty incredible things where God has shown up. Like, I know what Jesus is about, but I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes, even though we know what Jesus is about, it's a hard time for us to come to church when it's raining. It's a hard time for us to come to church when our team loses. Thank God George is good this year. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, numbers are good. Church is full, even on Thanksgiving week, because Georgia won. Like, I can praise Jesus now. Like, we're good to go. But I understand that. Sometimes life circumstances do not welcome the desire to be around other people and other circumstances and all that. But these people were like, I don't care about sickness. I don't care about people. I don't care about food. I don't care about sleep. I don't care about anything. I just wanna be with Jesus. And I love that mentality. It's so neat to see. So Jesus says to the disciples in the other three accounts, we're reading in John, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, he says this to him. He says, you give them something to eat. And we learn in John, he said that to test them to see what their response would be. And so why did he say to the disciples, you give them something to eat? When they answered Jesus, they were seeing no further than their own resources. And when you only see as far as your resources will take you, you're not gonna see very far in life. You're not going to encounter or do or accomplish what God's called you to accomplish. Because when we do it in our own strength and our own gifts, our own resources, our resources around us, we're not gonna accomplish much. But when we encounter and understand as an individual, a family, a church family, and we think about in regards to our own resources, we'll not accomplish much. But when we think about the resources and the economy of heaven that we have access to, we can do more than we could ask or even imagine according to Ephesians 3.20. And that's a, one of the examples and the glimpses that we're seeing in this passage because we have access to that. So here's what you got. So the disciples are standing there and they're, they're talking with Jesus and he says, you feed him. And then Andrew says, we're gonna break down Andrew a little bit, but Andrew says like, I mean, listen, we only got 200 denarii. I don't know how this is gonna work. We can't really do this. So their situation is almost like standing in front of the Niagara Falls saying, where can I get a drink? I'm so thirsty. I mean, it's so obvious, and some of you are analytically in here going, can you drink the Niagara Falls? Yes, it's clean water. You can drink Niagara Falls, it's not salt water. 
It's almost like standing in a Chick-fil-A and saying, is this chicken imported from the boundaries of heaven? The answer is yes. It's an obvious answer. It, it's kind of like... It's kind of like standing in a buffet line, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and say, is this sanitary? We all know the answer to that. We're just not going to talk about it, if you know what I'm saying. Like, it's one of those things. It's obvious. It's like living in the state of Georgia and saying, who's the best football team in the country? We would all say Louisville, would we not? I mean, really, no, I'm just kidding. Definitely not Alabama. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One, one of our previous staff members, I think she was in the first service, I was wearing this shirt last year. Amy, are you in here? She's, been, she's not in here. Amy, she said to me last year when I was wearing this for tailgate Sunday, she said, that's the most disingenuous shirt you've ever worn. And I went, there's probably some validity to that, but I like Georgia, I, I do. So no, I love, love the time to do that. But is, if, has, had anyone ever asked them, the disciples, hey, do you think like if they asked this question, just rhetorically speaking, before all this took place, hey, do you think Jesus could turn like five loaves of bread and two fish? Do you think he could feed like 15, 20,000 people with that, they'd go, yeah, I mean, I just, I just saw him heal a, heal, heal a paralyzed man. Yeah, yeah, he could do that. I just saw him turn water into wine. I have no idea how you, so yeah, yeah, I know he could do that. They would say resoundedly, they would say yes. But then when the situation came, they were too busy trusting their own sight to trust the God that was standing right in front of them, which is similar to what we do. Now, if we get a conversation going right now with y'all. I ask you a question. If this were to happen, do you think God could conquer, win, heal, provide victory in that situation? We'd all say, yeah, resoundedly, yeah, God can do that. Then we get the phone call. We get the diagnosis. And we say, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? I've done the numbers like Philip did. I've done the numbers and I just don't, I don't see it working. It's because we're thinking in the mindset of our own resources, not the resources of King Jesus. And this is a reminder that I need to hear daily in leadership of our church and leadership of my family and leadership of my own personal life to remind me that I have all the access to all the resources in the entire world and entire heaven through my savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we need to question. We can because he can. It's just a good reminder for us all. So the first character we're gonna look at today, which I've already mentioned a couple times, is Philip. So I got some good things. I think, I think they're directly from the Lord. I encourage you to write down. We don't have to fill in the blanks, but you can just write them down and some of them pop up on the screen. So the first character is Philip. And Jesus asked Philip a question. Um, he said, basically, how are we gonna do this? And I don't know if you've ever been in a small crowd and been asked a question or maybe in a classroom in college or in high school and they're like, hey, Nate, what do you think about that question? So like, if somebody asked me a question in a crowd like this, I can just answer it, I'm pretty good. Ask me a Bible question. I'm like, oh, well, I don't really know, but I'll research that. But something about a small group scares me sometimes. One on one, I don't mind, one on two, but when it's like 10 people, it kind of scares me. So I was at that conference and retreat I was telling you about. This pastor of 40 years was able to pour into just eight pastors for three days. It's an amazing experience. We're sitting there and we're talking about a sermon outline or something. I don't remember the details of what they're talking about. And the, the lead conversation pastor, the, the older gentleman, he says, Nate, what do you think about this? And I'm like deer in headlights. I'm like, <gasps> um, well, and so I said with extreme confidence and, and strength, Jesus, because <laughs> he's always the right answer. You know what I'm saying? Like you went to Sunday school when you were younger. That's the answer that you give. Well, poor Philip was put on the spot and he didn't know what to say. And the reason that Jesus asked Philip, because Philip is from the region. So he's like, where are we going to get food to feed these people? And he's testing Philip. And so verse five and six, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him for he himself knew what he was going to do. In verse seven, Philip asked him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. And so then Philip blew it. He, he didn't know what to do. So he counted the cost. Literally speaking, he counted the cost. He counted the people. He counted the cost per person. He counted the estimated wages that, that they had on hand, which is about 200 denarii, which is about half a year income of an average person in this day. And so it would be about six months of pay, which is a good amount of pay, but to feed 20,000 people a meal, it's probably gonna cost more than that. And he sits there in the next verse, he says, 200 denarii 
worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. And here's the thing about counting. It can be a good thing. It can help you figure out some solutions to a problem. But one thing Philip didn't take into account, which many of us don't as well, when you count the cost without Christ, your numbers will always be off. When you count the cost without Christ, your numbers will be off. How are we gonna pay this? How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna give this gift that God's called us to do? It's never gonna make sense until you include Christ in the equation. And so here's the thing about Philip. He's familiar with the land. He knew that there was no hope and he's familiar with the situation. He's familiar with the land, but he's also familiar with the man. He's familiar with Jesus. He's seen him do already at least five answers and five miracles. And so all he had to do was sit there on the spot, deer in headlights and with extreme confidence and strength and go, Jesus. And Jesus would have said, that's exactly right. Now, what do I need to do next? And he would have gone, oh, oh, give me some food, give it to him. He would have known what to do. But the obvious answer, the Sunday school answer that is always right, he forgot and he answered incorrectly. And he's like, yes, Lord, I know you turned the water into wine because these are miracles that he had seen beforehand. You made the paralyzed man walk. You healed that man's son. And I've known you, I know you have done some incredible things on the way here, but I just don't know if you can do this right now. And it doesn't, I can't imagine him saying those words, but he's demonstrating those words. And just like we wouldn't say those words in our circumstance, we demonstrate those words with our actions and with our life. And, and we and I, say the same thing. We would never say that he can't do this, whatever this, the, the, that blank may be. We believe that he can, but when it comes time to allowing God to show up, we just don't trust the God of our circumstances. And, and why don't we really trust God with our circumstances? Sometimes I don't know the answer to that. With, with our faith, with our kids, with our career, with our family, with our tithes of giving 10% of our finances to the Lord, with our job situation, with our, the, the, the building and, and when are we gonna move in? That's a great question. I'd love to know the answer to that. With, with things like that where we just don't know the answer, but we've got to trust God with it. Those are things that we have to trust God because God can, God says he will, and so therefore we have to trust him that he can, but when it comes to putting our trust in him with our lunch, we question that he can do it. And remember, he did it before. Whatever miracle he's done in your life, he can do it again. He did it before and he can do it again. He can and he will. And sometimes you have to say, Jesus, I'm hungry. I don't know where my next meal is going to be, but here's my lunch. I wanna be obedient to what God's calling me to do because my obedience is more important than my appetite. We're not talking about the boy yet, but that's essentially what he said. And some might say, well, well, why can't he just do the miracle? Why does he have to test Jesus? Because Jesus could have said, hey, you know what? Let's let quail fall from heaven and we'll feed everybody meat or we'll let manna fall from heaven and everybody will take a bite of them. They'll say, what is it? And they'll never have a clue and they'll be confused. And, but they'll eat it and they'll be hungry or they won't be hungry and they'll be full. But God chose to use the least of these and he chose to use the, the disciples as well to understand it. One reason why he could have tested them is because sometimes we face challenges, difficulties, and trials come in our life. Not temptations, temptations do not come from God. Trials, difficulties, and, and tests come from the Lord. But if we don't depend on him when he's right in front of us, then it's gonna be hard to depend on him when he's further away from us. Now, I'm not saying God moved because God doesn't move, but we do. And so the disciples are standing in front of the God of heaven. They're standing in front of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And they're standing there and they say, God, what are we gonna do, Jesus? I know you did all this stuff, but what are we gonna do? And, and if they can't trust him then, then when he ascends into heaven or when we leave the walls of the church, or maybe we're not in church for a couple weeks because life circumstances, we're in the hospital. When we're further away from where we should be, We've got to have the strength to trust God and when times when we're strong so that when, we, when we're weak, we have the ability to trust because that's where Philip, Philip was. And when we get the diagnosis, the phone call, a bill we can't afford, don't respond like Philip. Don't do the numbers because they're not gonna make sense, but trust the man that does. Because sometimes we don't know the answer, but we need to remind ourselves who has the answer. And that's where Philip was as well. Because Philip was more taken back by the magnitude of the masses than he was the magnitude of the man. He was more focused on the situation than he was on the Savior. And we have to do the same thing because that could be where we are. So Philip, Philip missed the miracle. 
He missed it. He had the opportunity to miss it. Let's get to the second character in the story is Andrew. Andrew in verse eight, it says, Andrew said, there was a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. And so Andrew basically saying, I don't have anything to offer, but I will go and see who does. So he sits there and looks at the situation and looks at Jesus and he's like, what are we gonna do? Who has some food? So he figures some things out and Andrew at least brought, brought him something to work with. But then he said, these items are so little for so many. And so he almost got it. And this is where I think is the saddest part of this message, passage. Matthew 14, 18, it's not in the passage in John. Jesus says this, he says, bring them to me. So Andrew comes along, he's like, hey, there's a boy over there that had all this food and everything. And so, I mean, could you work with that? Well, if he really believed that God could have worked with that, he would have brought it to Jesus. A lot of times we look at Jesus and we have a conversation with him like, Lord, there's a situation over there that we need to take and bring to Jesus. And that's what's going on with this disciple is he did not get it. And Andrew finds someone that can help, but then Jesus has to say, bring them to me, bring the food to me so that I can perform a miracle. He had to tell him what to do. It should have been second nature of this point. Andrew should have said, here is the food, do what, I do, do what you do best. Here is my son, which we may say, do what you do best. Here's my marriage, do what you do best. Here's my career, which I don't know what to do, do what you do best. Here's our building and our needs and our finances, Lord, do what you do best. Instead, they counted their change and counted the cost and trusted what they saw instead of what they had known because Jesus was much more than they saw. And they bring the food and Jesus is basically like, I was hoping you understand this, but you didn't. So Philip missed the miracle. Andrew almost understood the miracle. And in verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. I love this part. Have the people sit down. Have you ever been in a conversation and someone says, are you sitting down for this news? I remember when we were in Nashville, my wife and I were buying our first house and it was a buyer's market, so we lowballed the offer. We were like 20% less than asking price. And the realtor called me and said, are you sitting down for this news? And I remember grabbing a seat and going, I don't know why I'm sitting down, but I'm gonna sit down. And he says, they accepted the offer. And I jump up and down, I'm like, yeah, praising God, it was awesome. Well, Jesus says to him, he says, have them sit down because they are about to be fed and they are about to be shook by the work of my hands. And sometimes we just need to sit down and be ready for God to feed us in this passage, but also for us to be shook, for our world to be rocked by the work of his hands. And verse 10 and 11 says this, the men numbered about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. And like I said, that's probably about 20 to 25,000. And then it says something interesting in verse 11 and 12, and I love this. As much as they wanted, the end of verse 11 and the beginning of 12, as much as they wanted when they were full. I encourage you, if you write, in your, write in your Bible, I encourage you to write in your Bible. Get a pen out of the seat in front of you and just write, as much as they wanted when they were full. Because here's the thing, it went from being Walmart being closed and we don't know what we're gonna do to a golden corral, all you can eat sanitized buffet. I mean, they were full is what verse 12 said. And I love this. The original language of, language of the word full is an interesting word because it illustrates an animal or a horse standing at a feeding trough until they had all that they wanted to eat. And so they had everything that they wanted and their bellies were full. It's the same word also used in this one of my favorite verses in Mark 5, excuse me, Matthew 5, 6. It says this, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. The NLT says, satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. And Mark 6, 20, which is the same passage that we just read, it's just Mark's account. He says, everyone ate and was satisfied. Remember this, I encourage you to write this down. When you dine at the Lord's table, you will always be satisfied. When you dine at the Lord's table, you will always be satisfied. When you are filled with the righteousness of God, you won't need what the world has to offer. And I worded that very carefully. Because when you're filled with the righteousness of God, as that passage is talking about, you won't need what the world has to offer. You'll want it. You can ask any of our rehab friends, because we got several in our church, they want what they struggled with in the past. 
but you won't need it because you can and will be full if you sit at the Lord's table and you're satisfied but what he has to offer only. Verse 12 to 13, when they were fully told the disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. So it's interesting, 12 baskets. How many disciples were there again? 12. It's, it's almost like the Lord saying, I will always provide, I will always satisfy it. And when you need, turn to me, I am the correct answer, Jesus. And, and they, they looked every other direction, but the one answer that they had was being filled and being satisfied by Jesus Christ alone. Now to the boy. And so I, I kind of rewind a little bit, kind of tell his perspective, and this is kind of we'll end with kind of focusing on him. Um, but so here's the thing, and I'm kind of given some kind of narrative liberty in here. This didn't happen, but you can imagine something like this happening. A boy left his house one day. His mom provides a sack lunch for him. And back in the day, some of y'all, when you were kids, and this is me a little bit too, we, were, we weren't concerned too much, so much about safety in the world. Like you could hitchhike when you were six years old. It's like, I need to get a ride to practice. I'll just go stand on the side of the road. You'll get a ride. Like we get that. Well, in the first century, the kids would be like, hey mom, I'm gonna be gone for a couple days. And like, all right, you'll be good. We'll see you in a week or so. And they'd be like, I'm gonna go talk to strangers and eat their candy. And they'd be like, all right, sounds good. And so it was a little bit different there. So the kid disappears and he's going to follow Jesus. And he learned at a young age when you encounter Jesus, it changes your schedule. When you encounter Jesus, it changes your schedule. And then he followed thousands of people to this remote location. He's got his sack lunch and he's sitting there and he's got everybody in groups and he's just kind of sitting there like, what's gonna happen next? We're split up into groups. Like what's gonna happen with all these groups? I don't know which group I'm in, my friend's over there. And he's kind of with them. And then Philip says, hey, uh, does anyone have any food? And he's like, uh, yes, I do. And if I give this up, then I might not eat. And my friend, not in scripture, my friend, which is with me, we, we might not have anything to eat. But my obedience is more important than my appetite right now. And so he surrenders his food. And, and then he's like, you know what? I mean, even if we don't eat, it's worth to do what this Jesus guy is asking because I've already seen and heard of these miracles. So I'm just gonna do what God's called me to do. That's what you call a faith gift. And, and, and it's the, the kind of gift that just really takes faith because you don't know what's gonna happen after it. You give up that lunch, you might not eat. You give that gift, you don't know what's gonna happen. And the boy did something drastic and it gave God an opportunity to work. This is how most of us work today. And I say us, not you. We do something safe and we expect God to work. The boy did something dangerous and drastic and it allowed God to work. We do something simple and easy for us to do. Like, honestly, if we were around the room and said, hey, would it be okay if you fed somebody at wherever you ate today? You'd go, yeah, yeah, I could afford that. And it wouldn't be a big deal to share a lunch. But if God's calling you to do something drastic and something huge, whatever that may be, me not clarifying anything, let God speak to your heart in that. If God's calling you to do something drastic, it's like, ooh, I, I don't know if we could do that. But that's what a faith gift is. And, and few things God teaches to do through this passage and through this boy is, which I love. Is, so you can write these down if you want. First of all, is he was poor. So you're like, well, why does that matter? Well, it talks about how barley bread is actually the cheapest, lowest, lowest of the totem pole bread. It's the cheapest bread when you go into the bread aisle in the grocery store. It's the dollar a loaf, not the $8 a loaf. And so for some reason, my wife likes the $8 a loaf. I wish she liked the barley bread. Um, because you can't drive and, and get anywhere because you're paying for groceries today. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, but he has the barley bread. And so it's the least desired or the cheapest bread. He was insignificant as anyone in the crowd. He was very insignificant. He's just a boy in the crowd. He's nobody. So an insignificant, poor little boy that doesn't even have a name brought forth the biggest blessing because of his obedience. It's not the magnitude of the gift, it's the attitude of the giver. And so it wasn't so much that he brought a lunch, like that lunch was probably worth seven, eight, ten dollars or something like that in today's money. He brought the gift and he shared his lunch, so it wasn't the magnitude, it was the attitude. And one of the marks of a Christ follower that we can learn from this little boy is, is, is a few different things. First of all, he shared his lunch, he shared his lunch because he considers the needs of others before his own. 
He considered the needs of others before his own. Second thing, he shared his lunch because he was grateful, not greedy. I tell our kids all the time, hey kids, listen, when they're asking for more, can I have this? I'm like, you just had Christmas. You don't need another Christmas. And I'm like, they ask for more. I say, hey guys, be grateful. And they're like, not greedy. And I'm like, well, you remembered. At least you, maybe you'll remember it in the future too. But he was grateful, not greedy. The third thing is this, through this boy and sharing his lunch, we learned that little becomes much in the hands of the Messiah. Little becomes much in the hands of the Messiah because Philip missed the miracle. Andrew almost understood the miracle, but the little, the little boy believed Jesus for the miracle. And when you give to God, he blesses you and everyone around you. Because they gave, he gave faithfully and not only was he and his potential friend or if, if any family was with him, we don't know, they were blessed, but everyone around them, the thousands of people were blessed by his obedience. The little boy validated an understanding of something for us. He was poor, insignificant and no one and none of that matters. It doesn't matter who you are. Our obedience sets the stage for God's abundance. Our obedience set the stage for God's abundance, for miracles, for God working, for provision in your life, for his power. And our family may not eat if we surrender this, but I know God's called us to share our lunch. And that's what this little boy did. And generosity will be one of the key marks of a true follower of Christ, in my opinion. And I want us to be a church that's irrationally generous. I wanna to give to this community in a hundredfold what anyone else is doing because I want people to see, wow, that's what, that's what a Christian looks like. That's what a Christ follower looks like, giving like crazy. I don't want people to drive by and be like, wow, they got an amazing building. I want people to drive by and go, wow, that parking lot is full. Did you see what they did last week at Carnival? Like that was a free event. Like, wow, that, that church is really doing some work for this community and for the kingdom of God. Are you sharing what God has called you to share or are you holding on to it? Are you sharing what God has called you to share or holding on to it? Because the young boy gave it all away. You'll never regret what you give but you'll likely regret what you'll keep. Heard that a long time ago, and I think that's really good. What lunch do you need to share today? So I love sports. Um, I'm just any sport, except for, I'm not much of a hockey fan, um, but, but I, lo I love almost all sports. I could watch them, I could play them, I, I, I compete. I'm very aggressive and competitive with sports and with the high intensity violent sports like um, ping pong, foosball, and the church picnic, egg toss, I get way too competitive. Um, but I, I, I just, I've always loved sports. Some of you may look at me and like, he was probably a freak athlete in college. Thank you, I really was. Um, but yet I didn't play anything. But here's the thing, like I, I, I really loved basketball. I loved basketball. I was, I was decent. I wasn't very good. I, I could usually rebound even though I was a small guy because I just kind of pushed people back, if you know what I'm saying. But, but I was never gonna be much of a basketball player because I was about five foot 10 in the Caucasian descent, if you know what I mean. And so wasn't really good at basketball. And so this basketball in my hands, probably worth about $1.75 at a good yard sale. Probably worth that. But you put this, this basketball in the hands of Michael Jordan, it's worth about a million dollars. I'm sorry, a billion dollars because he's been a little bit successful and, and he's, he's just pretty incredible. And so I, I always loved football too. And I never, I, I played uh, some tackle football some, but I, I love flag football. So if I, I could go out in the parking lot right now and play flag, flag football, I'd have a lot of fun. I'd, I'd talk a lot of mess. Like I'm gonna beat everybody and probably get like six interceptions when I'm playing the quarterback. But I, I loved football. I had a lot of fun playing. Played all throughout my life in college. Like I said, mainly flag football and everything. So this football in my hands, it's, it's got a signature on it. Georgia player, so it's probably worth like, I don't know, seven to 10 bucks in my hands. You put, this, you put this football in Lamar Jackson's hand, the Baltimore Ravens, it's worth about $260 million. And I was gonna use a Falcons QB, but they don't recruit good QBs anymore, so <laughs> we won't use that example. But this isn't worth much in my hands, but you put it in Lamar Jackson's hand, it's worth a lot of money. You get a little boy it has a lunch, it's probably worth about 10 bucks. Probably feed about two or three people, maybe a couple more if you eat light. You put that lunch in Jesus' hands, it'll feed a village. Whatever you're holding on to, it's worth a lot more in Jesus' hands. It can do a lot more in Jesus' hands. So stop holding, stop hoarding, and start handing it over to Jesus and allowing him to use it. Because it's not about the gift. It's not about 
anything. I don't even know how you interpret this or apply this for the sharing of your lunch. But when you share your lunch, God will use it and multiply it a hundredfold. Everybody your head and close your eyes as we finish up. So the boy had five loaves, a bread and two fish. His lunch wasn't very powerful, but God used it and fed an entire city. What we have is given to us to be a ministry to someone else. Don't hold on to what God has called you to share. Because God didn't give to us to hold on to, but to bless. What blessings and miracles are you missing out on because you are keeping your lunch? I've heard it worded like this. If God calls you to give something or to share something and you keep it, you'll never enjoy it. Share your lunch, whatever that may be, and allow the miracles of God to be unleashed in your lives and the people's around you's lives. How often do we cling to something that's, that's just enough for us what are we clinging tightly to because you don't trust God to multiply it and give it back? Something for your family, for your community, opportunity to serve, faith gift is what this boy gave. And I don't know what God's calling you to share. It could be, it could be nothing. It could be everything. It could just be a step of obedience. Do what God's called you to do. Moving back in a time machine, I believe that um, this, this story took place. I really do. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I really do. Jesus stood on the side of that mountain, that huge hill, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, and he fed them. And the boy sacrificed his lunch. He gave his lunch to Jesus. And some of us in this room, we need to sacrifice much more than our lunch. Some of us in a room need to sacrifice our life before Jesus. We need to lay our life at the feet and at the cross of Jesus. Because a few years after that, after Jesus did this miracle, men and women, they, just like you and I, they took him, they beat him, they hung him on the cross. And God took all the sin of the world. He put it on Jesus Christ. He took our place. Nailed through his hands and through his feet when they needed to be through ours. But he took our place. He was our substitute. And it says in the Bible, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And many of you need to come to a point where you give, you sacrifice your life to Jesus. As God sacrificed his son, we need to sacrifice our life before him so that we can have eternal life in heaven. And so if you wanna surrender your life to Christ in this moment right now and give your life to Jesus, then you can just echo this prayer in the quiet of your own heart and surrender your life to Christ. You can have a conversation with God in this moment, maybe for the first time. And you can pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I know I've messed up but you didn't, you were perfect. You fed the 5,000, you healed people and you're changing my life right now. I give you everything. I lay my life at your feet. Please come into my heart and live with me forever. I step off the throne of my life and I put you on the throne to live forever. In Jesus name, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you just prayed that prayer, real simple, would you just slide your hand up in there until I kind of acknowledge your side of the room? Awesome, I see you over there on the left. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. A couple of y'all, same area, I appreciate that. Thank you for being honest. I see you in the middle, I'm proud of you. Anybody over on the right, I see a little hand in the back. I'm really proud of you. Anybody else that I didn't see? Okay, several, several of y'all, that's amazing. Well, let, let me just say this to, to the church, to the people that are here, and to you that have raised your hand, whether you've been here for a month, a year, or this is your first time, you're the reason we do what we do. You are for one more. And so we're so proud of you. We're here for you. It says in the Bible that when you surrender your life to Christ, it says tens and thousands of angels are rejoicing in heaven at this moment. And so let's do it a little bit differently, kind of like we started out in service, due to the responding to the four or five people that raised their hand. Can we just get a, a round of applause real quick for them real quick? That's right. It's amazing. So proud of you. And so if you made that decision, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray right now and, and, and close this out and then we're gonna transition to just some quick worship. 
but as we stand to worship and all of us will stand at the same time, if, if you raise your hand and said, that was me, then if you meant it, then right now you'll mention it. And the way to mention it is to go to the, the back of the room. Um, we'll do in the back of the room, we have some of our volunteers that are called our prayer partners. And you can just say, hey, I raised my hand. They'll take the conversation from there. Or maybe you're struggling with something that you need to share, whatever that may be in your life. We'll talk to them about it. They'll pray for you. They'll pray with you. Because we want to be a church that encourages you and helps you understand what this life is all about and what it means. And we want to help you in that. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for a little boy. Each week we get to say thank you for a king, thank you for a savior, thank you for an incredibly talented man or woman of scripture. But Lord, right now we get to say thank you for a little boy and his faith. Lord, help us to have that faith to just trust you with our lunch. Whatever our lunch may be, just to trust you with our lunch, not ourselves. Knowing that you can take it, you can multiply it, and you can feed 20,000 people instead of myself. Lord, use us and help us to walk in obedience to what a faith gift looks like in our life and our circumstances of sharing our lunch. Lord, I pray for those that got saved in these few minutes. I pray that as we stand up, they go to the back of the room and they talk to somebody and we begin to walk them through what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. Thank you for for this morning and what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. 